It's Father's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful fathers out there. Not just for being shining examples of how great a dad can be, but also for being wonderful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important. Just knowing you're there when we need you. You've been patient with us, helping us to grow and learn from all the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today, we thank you, Dad, for all of this and so much more. Happy Father's Day. Good to see you here today. Special day, dads. Uh, you got a warm one to celebrate today, but good to have you here. Any guests that might be here this morning, welcome. Good to have you here. Good to be back with you. Uh, we got back late Monday night, and uh, you know how trips go. You get back totally exhausted, but we had a blast. So uh, good to be here. I heard Pastor Brant really enjoyed you. Hopefully it was mutual. Um, he's a great guy. So couple of things just to uh, get us, get me maybe reacclimated to things going on here. If you didn't pick up a directory last Sunday, if you weren't here, they are here. Please pick one up. Linda or somebody will be in the back uh, handing those out at the end of the service today. So make sure you pick one up. Um, our schedule says missions committee meeting Wednesday at 630. And I know I have a conflict that night. So committee, we can communicate on whether you want to meet or, or reschedule. But, uh, but check your bulletin. I, I do want to highlight tonight's event because I talked to Pastor Hobalt and he said he didn't get it in the paper. So we're a little concerned, but, but I'm, I'm really thinking this is kind of a special thing we have here. Um, I know that Mark, is it Mark Umfleet? Um, what's his name? <laughs> Anyway, yeah, Mark Umfley. Okay, uh, he won the male, well, country male vocalist and comedian of the year. I think that award was given down in Branson, Missouri. So he's he's uh, had quite a an exposure and quite success. But I think the thing that excites me is that his success, from what I'm hearing, and I haven't met the man yet. We're just kind of the the venue, but his success is in his ability to present the gospel in a unique way that really reaches home and really uh, evokes a response in the heart. So I think if you're free tonight, you would be blessed if you're able to be here. Uh, it's only going to be about an hour, maybe a slightly bit beyond that uh, event tonight, starting at 6 o'clock right here at, at Redeemer. So if you're free, uh, plan to come tonight. I think you'll be blessed. Otherwise, check your bulletins for anything that might pertain to your schedule. Any announcements that I should make? You know, when you're gone for two weeks, you kind of lose touch with uh, what's going on. But, okay. Well, let's open with worship. And before we do that, let's welcome the one to whom we offer our worship. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you in this very room this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us as we come together corporately as your people, as your body, as your bride. Thank you, God, that even when we're not together as your people, you're still with us, and yet you come to us in 
a special way when your people gather. And we ask you, Lord, today that you would speak to us, that our hearts would be open to your voice, that any hindrances would be removed, that you would be glorified, and that our lives would be touched. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to begin by this uh, old but very familiar and simple chorus, acknowledging our triune God. Let's start as we sing, Father, I adore you. happened on a cross doesn't seem right to use the words wonderful and yet it was by that cross by his cross that we can come before him this morning 
and know that we stand before him forgiven and free and clean. I would invite you to enter into that once again as we confess our sin. The words are printed before you in your bulletin. O oh Lord, you have promised to send your Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us. Yet we confess the many times that our eyes can't see you, that our hearts can't fathom your work in our pain. Forgive us for assuming we are on our own to navigate this life. Teach us to pray expectantly for the Holy Spirit to reveal your goodness. Give us the strength to wait and the courage to trust in you. We place our lives in your keeping. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. As the prophet Isaiah told us, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The beginning of my prayer list this morning is for continued prayers for Gordon Bourne as he continues to recover at home from his open heart surgery. Spoke to him uh, night before last and uh, doing well, but there's still a lot of, of pain, broken ribs in the midst of the surgery as well as everything that took place. So he's appreciating, he said to remind tell the congregation thank you for all of your response and cards and calls. I know he said he gets tired out by, by visits, but uh, so he's, he's hoping to have some quiet time and just recovering, but he's doing well, so that's a good thing. Uh, ask your prayers for Steve and Steve Bounty and Sarah Belfi, who were married here yesterday afternoon as they begin their life together. And just received this request this morning, uh, 10-year-old Lydia Smith, he's, she's the granddaughter of Bob Herman, many of you know, working at the hospital. She's on her way to Ann Arbor, Michigan this weekend for her fifth open heart surgery as a 10-year-old girl. So let's keep Lydia in our prayers this morning. Also became aware that it's... Uh, Dwight and Carol's 51st wedding anniversary today, so we want to celebrate with you and thank God for you. But other prayer requests? Yes. Speech, Dwight? Pardon? Speech? Pardon? <laughs> he gets that way. <laughs> yes, Leanne. Today, happy anniversary, Marshall and Janet Hangar. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you heard Marshall. He said she's a saint. <laughs> Fifty-eight. That's a good. That's a quite a an accomplishment. Any other requests, Myrene? Today. Tomorrow, Angie and Tim Longstaff, 35 tomorrow. <laughs> Where are you? There you are. All you silent people over here, 35 years. Yes. Dave and Marlis Huber, 39 years yesterday. Well, Dad, your thunder just got totally <laughs> stolen. But. Any others? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Continued, we need that. We need revival on our whole world, but we need it in our country for sure, in our town, in our church. So, thank you. Anything else? All right, let's pray together. Mm -hmm. 
Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, we're mindful, God, that from beginning to end, in the mystery of this life and the purpose you put upon us in this life, you are here with us to guide us all the way through until our final destination. We're mindful today, Lord, that this world is not our home. Your word tells us we're just passing through. We're on our way somewhere, much, much beyond what this world can offer. And Lord, I'm, and the rest of us today are especially mindful that you have equipped us and given us roles in this life and use, you use us toward that ultimate purpose of leading us home. And you raise up fathers in that specific role of being leaders spiritually to their children, to their families. So God, we lift up fathers today and ask your anointing upon them, your wisdom to fill them, your love to guide them, your vision to be their vision. Father, we pray for those who are recovering. We think of Gordon Bourne this morning, uh, about a month removed from his surgery, continuing to recover and deal with pain and deal with healing. Lord, just pour out your healing touch upon him. We ask you to guard his heart physically as well as spiritually. Give to them everything they need, Lord, to continue to recover uh, in every way, uh, physically for sure, but Lord, we know that a surgery like this takes its toll emotionally and, and spiritually as well. So lift them up, Lord. We pray for Lydia Smith, 10 years old, Lord, this young girl dealing for her entire life with this heart issue, and you know all the details. Lord, I, we pray together that this, this appointment that's about to take place would be effective in her healing and in her recovery and in making right what hasn't been right in her body for a long time. Use this surgery, use this appointment with these doctors, give them skill and wisdom and insight to do what is necessary. And Lord, have your hand upon Lydia, upon her family, and make it known, God, that your presence is right there. Make it known that your love for her is beyond measure and your plans for her beyond fathomable. We entrust them into your keeping. We ask, God, for your blessing and, and guidance in the lives of Steve and Sarah Bowney as they begin their new life together. Give them a unity that is, that is born in your spirit. Give them a, a direction and a vision for life that is Christ-centered and fulfilling because you are leading. Give them purpose that would spill into their vocations and into their daily lives and families. So Lord, guide them in this new life together. Father, we pray for your presence and your joy to fill all the celebrations that we've brought up this morning. We think of 58 years for Marshall and Janet Nygaard, 51 years for Dwight and Carol Scott, and 39 years for Dave and Marlis Huber, and 35 years for Tim and Angie Longstaff. And Lord, I suspect there are other celebrations going on, but Lord, enter into those wherever you are welcome. And as you look into these hearts, and we know you are welcome in these hearts, enter into it and bring a joy that surpasses human understanding. Bring a joy that uh, is beyond circumstances. Give uh, blessing, Lord, into these marriages. And let that blessing flow from these marriages into their families. And Lord, we ask, we continue to ask for revival for hearts that are softened toward you in this land. We ask God for a breaking through 
and Lord, I think that's an accurate description of what our hearts need sometimes is a breaking through because they get pretty crusted over. Break through that crust, Lord, and enter in. We ask God that that would happen in those who maybe aren't asking even for it to happen, who don't know it can happen. We ask God for that to happen on every level from the leadership of our country to the most humble of persons. And God, we ask that as your spirit is welcomed, that you would show us your willingness to pour it out and change direction in lives, in communities, in nations. Lord, thank you that you are more willing to give than we are to receive. Increase our capacity to receive. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you would turn in your bulletins to our faith response from the word, uh, these words from 2 Corinthians 6, please join together. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. We're treated as impostors yet are true, as unknown yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live. As having nothing yet possessing everything call on our ushers this morning if you would come forward and receive our tithes and our offerings. seat and I'll call on Elaine Niebuhr to bring us uh, the readings from God's word this morning.
The Old Testament lesson for today is found in the book of Psalms on page 498 of your Pew Bible. I'll be reading from chapter 68, verses 4 through 10. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, and exalt before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth quaked, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched. Your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O God. The New Testament lesson is found in the book of Ephesians on page 1000. I'll be reading from chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether slave or free. The gospel for today is found in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 15 through 22, on page 894. Will you please stand as you are able? And they were bringing in even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Here ends the gospel. Please be seated.
According to God's word, he gives earthly parents the role that is perhaps the most vital of their lives, of their purpose here on earth, and that is of raising up their children in such a way that Jesus has first place in that child's life, above everything, above everyone else. And I, I have to say, that happening 
that, that isn't something that is just going to happen by itself without a role model to lead them in that direction or lead them by example. And dads, guess who it is to whom God primarily gives that task? Ephesians 4, or 6, verse 4, we heard Elaine read it. Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I want you to keep that, that statement in mind from Paul in relation to something that Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, where he said, as you heard, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. So I want to spend a few minutes this morning looking at what that means because hindering children from having a relationship with Christ isn't always an intentional thing. To hinder them isn't always intentional. But unfortunately, hindering our children from coming to Jesus doesn't require intent. It just happens very naturally. (laughs) It's our nature. But establishing them in a relationship with Jesus Christ does require intent. So we need to look at this morning what our influence and our intentions as as parents are having on our kids. And I I think too many well-intentioned parents are, are probably just content to establish religion into their kids' lives, and to some degree, thinking that by doing that, they're probably then equipping their kids to face life with a a well-rounded outlook. And you know what? Almost always, when a parent tries to build religion into their kids' lives, it becomes, the religion then becomes categorized into just a certain part of the kid's life. I mean, there's probably some level of commitment to Sunday morning worship, uh, maybe a little more involvement in the youth group or even serving on a committee when you're young. But then the rest of their lives are, are guided too often by a different perspective and a different set of rules. And supposedly, as the child grows, that child is going to find a balance between their religious life and the rest of their life. That's kind of how a lot of families are doing it. But this isn't what Jesus was talking about when he said, permit the children to come to me. In fact, he wasn't talking about religion at all. He was talking about spending time with him, our kids spending time with him for the purpose of getting to know him. And from that personal relationship, then allowing faith to be born and to grow in our child's lives. You see, religion is a man-made thing. You know that, don't you? Religion is, comes from earth. It's defined by human understanding of God. That's what religion is. That's why there are so many of them, so many different understandings of God. And depending on who you're talking to or what culture you're living in, it's going to vary just about any place you go, especially as you go into other nations which means God is going to be defined in a lot of different ways according to religion. And you, you think about that, and you have to also ask the question, does the identity of God really depend on people's understanding of Him? And we know the answer to that. Of course it doesn't. Human understanding of anything, including God, you know where that comes from. It comes from a fallen nature. It's terribly flawed. I want to tell you something that a lot of people, I think, are are kind of slow to grasp. God, it's this, God doesn't require anything from us that originates out of our fallenness. And religion originates with humanity. Faith is a relationship with God. And it comes through Jesus Christ as we get to know Him. And if we're going to guide our children in this thing called faith through a humanly flawed understanding of God, religion, 
we will be hindering them. <laughs> we will be hindering them. And Jesus said, don't hinder them. Let them come to me. I think part of the flawed understanding that originates with humanity is the idea that if we do enough good things in this life, God is going to be pleased enough with us to let us into heaven. That's why this incident that we just heard uh, Elaine read from the gospel about the rich ruler, it's why it's in there. You read that, and on, you look at this on the surface, and you can't deny it. I mean, this guy that came to Jesus was a good guy. <laughs> he was a good guy, and Jesus knew that. He, first thing he said to him, he said, you know the commandments. You know what's interesting is that the, the five commandments that Jesus listed when he was talking to this man are the ones that involve physically doing something or not doing something in order to keep them. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do honor your father and your mother. All these things you do in your life that are outwardly visible to other people. There, I don't think there would have been probably anybody in that crowd that day who could have come up and said about this man, you know he's not a good guy. I don't think there would have been. And he responded to Jesus when he said, listed these five commandments, he says, I've done all these things, I've done them. But the other commandments that Jesus didn't list, have all of them have more to do with the condition of a human heart than with what a person does. And when Jesus brings up the one thing that was hindering this man from knowing God personally, it pointed directly at the first commandment. And it had to do with the condition of the man's heart. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. What did Jesus tell the guy? He said, I, you really, are you serious about what you're asking me about heaven? He said, then go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's not a requirement of everybody to go to heaven. But for this man it was. Not to get to heaven, but because of what Jesus knew about the man. Why did he tell him sell everything? Because the man's possessions were the most important thing in his life to him. And Jesus had looked into his heart and he knew that that was the case. You have another God in your life, sir. Get rid of it. Because it's hindering you from knowing the one true God. And it's preventing God from using you to help others get to know him as well. And the man wasn't willing to raise God up above his earthly possessions. I mean, it shows, doesn't it, how, how, how subtly we can fool ourselves into thinking that we might be righteous before God by the things we do or the reputation that we might have built in our life. Dads, don't hinder your children from coming to Jesus when they're little. Or the same hindrances that were in this man's life will come into your children's lives. And I'm not saying maybe, I'm saying they will. And it might not be the same other God of riches, but it will be something that takes the place of the Lord, which is given a higher place in our kids' lives than knowing Jesus. It'll be something that originates from a fallen creation rather than from heaven. You know, God asks a pretty important question in the 24th Psalm. He says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? And then he answers it. He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who doesn't lift up his soul to what is false who doesn't swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from, from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Now, listen to what he says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and you all know this verse. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. 
These are the ones who will stand in his holy place. You know what I think an issue is amongst Christians too often? We're more intent on seeking his hand than we are seeking his face. We seek the things that he can do for us. The ways he can bring favor and blessing into our lives. But we don't seek his face. I don't think often enough like he would have us do. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is just simply the desire to be in his presence. For, to, to, to forget about what we want him to do for us. And just focus on coming into his presence. I don't know if you remember, if you were here a few weeks ago, we looked in Exodus 38 at how Moses was dealing with all of the rebellion of of the Israelites in the wilderness, having come out of Egypt, and God got so fed up with them, he said, I'll give you, I'm not going to back out of my promise, I'll give you the land, I'll, I'll open the door for you, but I'm not going with you. Remember what Moses said? He said, no. He said, I would rather stay here if you're here than go into the promised land if you're not going to be there. Because Moses understood that the best thing that could ever happen to us is to be in the presence of God, wherever that might be. Yeah, his hand is mighty. But the key to having peace and purpose and victory is not to seek first his hand, but to seek his face. And to get to know him. I think as I look back on the years of ministry, unbelievable how fast they go, but one of the greatest joys of the years, the most rewarding parts of my ministry, I think, has been to dig into this word with young people and to watch as God begins to reveal himself to them as they begin to learn how to seek his face. And honestly, young people, I know there aren't a whole lot of you here this morning, but this is something we really need to get back into right here, young people. And if you're, uh, I'm going to say this this morning, if you're willing as a young person in this church right now, in this community, to really seek God's face, and I mean seriously, I would love to help you do that. I really would. I say that very conscious of the decades between your age and mine. And I I don't want to in any way be a hindrance to that happening. But if we had the young people in this church today who are really sincerely willing to be led by someone old, that old someone standing before you is willing to spend time with you in getting to know Jesus better. And if any of you want to make that commitment, Sign your name on a page and and hand it to me and and we'll see what comes together. I'm just going to throw that out there. And I bring this up because I I think you are aware of it, but if you aren't, you need to be. Young people in particular are so intensely being targeted by Satan these days. And there are so many temptations being thrown at you. You need to be close to him or you will be swept away in this world. I also need to say to dads and moms, this isn't only the responsibility of the church or the pastor. God gave it primarily to you. Don't hinder them. There's nothing more important, dads, moms, that, than you, that you can do or that you can give your children than to instill within their hearts the first commandment to know the Lord God and have no other gods before him in your life. How, could, how might we be hindering this from happening? And this is a thing that I, I know I fall under conviction of and maybe some of you do, but it, I think it's by holding other things in our own lives to, in, a, in a more important place than the place we give to God. And I say this as a word of caution to all of us because it's so easy for us to rationalize and tell ourselves, tell ourselves that God is the most important thing in our lives and then not even recognize that 
while we're telling ourselves and others this is so, it isn't showing by how we're living our lives. And believe me, what we show in our lives is going to influence our children a lot more than what we say. Don't hinder the children from coming to Jesus. Parents, I'm going to ask you to be completely honest with yourself right now. And this applies to parents of children of any age. As parents, we all want our kids to have a good life. I know that. We would do anything. We'd do whatever we could to spare our kids children from having a difficult life if we see that hardship coming, wouldn't we? I want you to put yourself into a situation. Say that your child takes to heart this call to seek his face seriously, and he or she has an experience in coming to know Jesus Christ that changes your child's life. And I mean changes his, her life in such a way that there is no mistaking about what happened to that kid. Your, your kid's priorities in life have changed. He's reading his Bible every day now, every spare time she has. He's talking to his friends about Jesus. You notice that in the conversations. She's making sure you're ready for church on time rather than you trying to get her ready. And within a couple of weeks, you notice that your child's phone is starting to ring a lot less, and your child's friends aren't coming over so much anymore. There are a couple new friends coming over, and they're carrying Bibles with them. Here's where I'm asking you to be honest. If you're in that situation, are you going to tell your son, your daughter, you know, hey, I'm really glad that God's important in your life, but I think maybe you're taking this a little far. If you keep this up, pretty soon you're not going to have any friends left. They're already pulling away from you. I mean, it's okay if church is important important to you, but don't let it take away your life. Parents, when Jesus says, don't hinder the children from coming to me, he wasn't putting any conditions on where this might take them. He didn't say don't hinder them from coming to church or don't hinder them from getting involved in a Bible study or don't hinder them from finding friends who feel the same way about me. He's saying don't hinder them from seeking my face. Don't stop them from coming into my presence. Don't stop them from entering into a relationship with me that will change their lives, whatever that might look like. Don't stop, them, don't stop them from loving me more than life itself. Would you, as parents, be worried about what's going to happen to your child if he or she falls head over heels in love with Jesus? Would you consider it wise to step into your child's life and pull back the reins a little bit in order to spare them the hardship that you see coming because of their relationship with Jesus? And I guess before you would do that, I want you to hear something else Jesus says, and this is in Luke chapter 9. He says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one, she's the one who will find it. If you see something unscriptural in your child's faith, by all means, as a parent, it's your responsibility to step in and set, the, set them on course. But not not if it's because your, your child loves Jesus to the point of bringing out a worldly reaction against him. And if you do step in it to set them on course, be sure the course you set them on is God's and not yours. And this is where it's so important for you as dads, as moms, to know what's in God's word. Because if you don't know what it says, how can you guide your children in this faith? Fathers especially, God says that you are given responsibility from him and accountable to him for how you deal with that responsibility. And mothers, if you're the only ones available to accept the role, don't turn away from it by any means. 
because sadly that's too often the case. As hard as it might be to imagine this, how you lead your family, parents, in spiritual things is going to be evaluated one day on a high court and it's going to be evaluated on a much higher scale than how much money you brought home or how well you managed it or how many friends you had. None of those things will have any bearing on your eternity. But your, how you influence your children in their relationship with Jesus will be a topic that, of conversation that you have with God one day, I promise you. And it comes down ultimately to the same choice the rich ruler had to make. Is Jesus really going to have first place in my life or is there something else to which that place is, is given? And our answer to that question is going to determine whether or not, whether or not we raise up our children to raise up Jesus in their lives. So it's Father's Day. A day we honor our fathers. It's actually a command of God that we do this. I'm going to suggest that this Father's Day today is a perfect day for fathers right here in this room to commit or to recommit to being the Father that our Heavenly Father called us to be. So I'm going to call on fathers of any age, and not on, I'm going to even say not only fathers, I would call on anyone who has the desire in their heart to one day be a father. And I realize I could be talking to men who maybe don't feel like they've been the kind of father God wants them to be to this point. And I know some of you didn't grow up in a home with a godly father. But as you begin to understand this high calling on your life, there is always the, the, this tendency to feel like we failed. That's not what God wants us to be embracing today. We all fail. That doesn't stop God. He wants to lift you up today and to equip you with whatever you feel right now or, or whatever you need right now, whatever that might be. And maybe it's forgiveness or maybe it's unconditional love not only for you, but to be poured through you. Or maybe it's a new focus or a clearer vision in your life. Whatever it is. Anything that God would ask you to provide for your children, you know that He will give to you to hand to them. And if we ask Him even now, He says, I'm ready to give. You have not because you ask not. Zephaniah 3 says, He looks at you and rejoices over you. So fathers, those who desire to be fathers, those who are willing to accept the role of having a spiritual influence on another person's life. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, right now. And I would just like to pray over us. Can we do that? And this might be kids who desire someday to be a dad. Jesus, you're here. You've told us, don't hinder your kids in any way. And, and Lord, that happens in ways we don't even think about, we're not even aware of, but you are. So Jesus, I, for every man or young person or whoever might be standing, whoever is standing with a desire to have an, a spiritual influence over the lives of another, we acknowledge to you right now, Jesus, that it comes only from you. This is a heaven of heavenly origin, not earthly. It comes from heavenly understanding, not human. And God, we turn to you and ask you for a wisdom, a love, a purpose for our kids or for those who will be our kids down the road, you know, that will set them on this path that leads them before your face. God, take away the fear of being stigmatized as being too radical for Jesus. Take away anything that hinders us from being the leaders you call us to be and anything that hinders our kids from seeking your face. 
And God, we desire, and I will state this, and anybody who is in agreement with it in their hearts, you see it, Lord. We desire to be a church that above everything else knows you and loves you and wants to be in your presence. Equip these people standing here, Lord, to that purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to close our service this morning by singing number 330, uh, Faith of Our Fathers, 330. have a blessed day today. Celebrate fatherhood. Celebrate the role that God has given you. Rejoice in each other and most importantly rejoice in him because he's with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor today and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you this week.